everybody. I'm Ben Schmidt. Uh, I'm CSO at Polyswarm. Uh, if you want to find out more about us, uh, talk to me afterwards, but uh, I'll jump right in because uh, hoping we have enough time. But uh, today I'm going to be talking about smart contract honeypots, uh, which are vulnerable uh, things that look like vulnerable Ethereum smart contracts that people have been deploying to the mainnet. Uh, to try and trick people into sending Ethereum to them uh, and then actually failing to exploit the contracts so that the attacker can actually take all their money. Uh, what we're not going to be talking about today uh, are how to find these things, uh, scams that aren't really about trying to attack people uh, uh, who are exploiting smart contracts, or whether or not that's legal or not. Uh, I wouldn't recommend doing it, but uh, you could take that as you will. So, First off, uh, I just need to go over uh, some basics about Ethereum Solidity for people who haven't looked at it before uh, so that you can sort of understand what's going on in some of these tricks. Um, but the uh, Ethereum uh, is uh, a blockchain platform uh, that allows you to not only send money but also write smart contracts that process money in interesting ways. So uh, there's two types of accounts that you can have in Ethereum. Uh, one is an external account, which is what normal people use. They send money uh, to and from other people, and it's pretty standard for cryptocurrencies. The other is a contract account, which essentially has associated code and data, uh, and that code actually manages uh, how funds tra fund transfers work and can record things to the chain, etc. So accounts uh, send and receive transactions, which are essentially proposed changes to the state of the chain. If they're valid, a miner uh, will eventually confirm them to the chain for a fee, and uh, at that point they're accepted as valid and stay around for you know until uh, uh, the heat death of the universe. Um, the uh, the fees for these transactions are paid in are, are called gas. They're, they're paid in Ether the, uh, or ETH, uh, the default currency on the platform. So these contracts uh, all compile down to uh, simple bytecode that runs on something called the EVM, the Ethereum Virtual Machine. Uh, it's documented in paper. We won't go over it too much in this uh, because most of these things don't actually depend on you knowing all that much about it uh, because a lot of what they do is uh, actually publish the source code of the contracts, but uh, in ways that are sort of deceptive that uh, uh, more naive attackers don't understand. Uh, so each instruction um, has an associated cost to it. So, so this uh, interpreter is Turing complete. Um, you, the, the only caveat to that is that every single instruction you run costs you money. So if you have something like an infinite loop, uh, your transaction will never complete because you don't have enough money for it to run for infinity. So that's how they sort of get around the, the whole thing problem stuff. Uh, so in general, most people don't actually directly write uh, Ethereum bytecode. They use a higher level language. And in this case, by far the most popular is something called Solidity. So Solidity is statically typed. Uh, it's Turing complete. Uh, and it's sort of JavaScript-like, but uh, if you try and write certain things like you're using JavaScript, then things are gonna break or bad things are gonna happen. But uh, what these contracts do is they essentially manage the flow of money. So uh, your goal here is to write more complex things other than just, I wanna send this money to this other person. So you can have it sent to five people or write a gambling app that uh, distributes it to you know, people based on some random number generator. Um, so every single contract has a constructor that gets run when you deploy it to the chain. And that uh, basically sets up the state of the contract. So that constructor, after it's been executed when deploying the contract, disappears. It's not actually stored as the code in the chain. Uh, but basically runs the setup for uh, whatever you're trying to deploy. The functions in those contracts, on the other hand, are deployed, and uh, by default, unless you mark them as limited, anyone on the chain can call into these things. And when you call into this function, it goes off and can modify state in some way. So each contract 
uh, also has one unnamed function uh, called the fallback function. And basically, it gets called if the uh, uh, if uh, it doesn't if it's not known what function you are trying to call. So if you send something without uh, uh, specifying what function you want to call, or if you call a function that isn't actually there, this gets executed. Uh, a lot of times, people just revert uh, in this in this function, but. Be, because you don't really know how much gas it is, and it might have been a mistake, but sometimes it will actually do interesting things here. So the way that you call functions is you create a transaction, but you also attach some transaction data to it. So transactions, uh, transaction data consists of a method ID followed by arguments. So the method ID should is a 32-bit uh, um, integer that should uniquely identify a function in the contract, and tells, uh, tells the dispatcher where to, which function to execute. Uh, and then you pass along whatever arguments that you're going to use to uh, call this thing. So in this example, we're calling uh, approve, which uh, is some function in some contract, but we're attaching uh, some additional data to it, in this case, an Ethereum address. So this is well documented, uh, constructing data is pretty easy and it's abstracted away through a bunch of different APIs. But uh, but if you wanted to code it and you don't have source, uh, you might have to work a little bit because you don't actually know what the function signature is. So in addition to directly calling contracts, contracts can actually call other contracts. So this is done through something called message calls, uh, but it's also alternatively referred to as internal transactions. But this allows for things like uh, library contracts. So you deploy, you, you want to deploy a certain contract a bunch of times, uh, but you don't want to have to pay to store the code more, a lot of the code more than once. So you deploy a library, and then you deploy all these other contracts that refer to the library. So uh, you can actually build these nice, complex sort of chains where uh, you do one thing in one contract, and it updates some other ones that are related, but they're all standalone. It's useful, but it also adds complexity that allows you to sort of hide some interesting stuff. Uh, and this is just an example of something that's calling back and forth through, uh, through an example contract. Um, so, talked a bit about code, but there's also storage in Ethereum, which uh, uh, is the persistent storage area uh, on the network. So contracts need to be able to maintain state between each of the transactions on the network. So there is a key value store that basically maps 256-bit integers to 256-bit integers, and it uh, um, allows you to store data uh, directly onto the chain and refer to it later. Uh, so you can keep track of balances, uh, manage, you know, whatever. Uh, there's two other places that contracts can use for data, memory and stack. Uh, these are not persistent, but they are far cheaper to use. So uh, oftentimes people will try and use those as much as possible if they don't actually need to store it. Variables default to using the storage as their backing, so you have to explicitly declare them uh, otherwise if, if you want to. So uh, there's some common flaws. I definitely recommend uh, looking at my coworker Paul Mikowski's talk on some of these flaws more in depth, but uh, they're, uh, these are the ones that are sort of most relevant to this talk. Uh, there's unhandled reentrant control flow, which was used to exploit the Dow contract and stole something like 3.6 million ether. Uh, but basically what it means is that a contract calls out to another attacker controlled contract, but doesn't appropriately update its state before doing so. So the attacker contract can then call back in to the uh, original contract and execute the same function. So what this allows you to do is to say, if you don't update the balance of a user, uh, before you do this, uh, you can call back in uh, uh, to the same function over and over and over again and keep withdrawing your money, even though you shouldn't have any at the time. Uh, delegate call into vulnerable libraries. Uh, so this was used uh, in the parity hack, which basically uh, allowed someone to uh, call in to a function that people thought couldn't be called in a library that they had. Uh, that allowed them to reinitialize the library and declare themselves the sole owner of all the funds in this multi-signature wallet, which then allowed them to withdraw it to some address. Uh, 
there's also a related problem of unprotected critical functions, which came up again in another parity attack, uh, where you could still call this function if you directly talk to the library. Uh, this allows someone to actually freeze about a $150 million worth of cryptocurrency, and it's still unrecoverable today. And the last one uh, that's relevant is uh, the improper handling of secrets. So uh, when you have gambling applications, one of the most popular things uh, on, on the network right now, uh, it allows you, uh, so, so it's sometimes very difficult to get random numbers in there that are actually secure for a gambling app. So oftentimes people make the mistake of doing things like storing the secret on the chain and uh, putting it into a private variable and they think that means that no one can read it, but you actually can directly read that off the chain uh, using some, uh, some pretty simple tools. So uh, you could obviously cheat. Uh, these are some tools for doing all those things. Uh, I won't go into them too much, but uh, definitely check out the awesome theory of security stuff. It sort of uh, links to everything that's of interest. Um, so smart contract honeypots. So the reason this is popular is You've got a ton of bad code, and you can send this money that cannot be transferred back. You have no recourse once it's stolen. So a lot of people think that's you know free money. So after all these hacks, they're uh, with huge dollar amounts. Lots of people started looking to exploit these contracts. So uh, some enterprising individuals figured out that maybe they could trick these attackers into giving them money uh, when they think that they're going to get some huge payday. So these honeypots all, uh, without fail, require you to send Ether into the contract, uh, and they look like they're vulnerable to some of these common flaws, but they're actually trying to exploit the people exploiting them. So uh, I got interested in this because I wrote a smart contract challenge uh, for Hack in the Box, where uh, you, it, it was a classic reentrancy bug, but uh, people weren't actually able uh, to exploit it unless they had a private key that I gave. Uh, so, so uh, the goal of the challenge was to bypass a withdrawal limit. So I put about fifty dollars of ether in each account, and people would, uh, uh, by default, only be able to withdraw three times a very small amount of money, like three bucks worth of ether. Uh, and the goal was to try and withdraw way more than three times. So you could use uh, one of these reentrancy this reentrancy bug to actually get money. Uh, <laughs> the the Interesting part uh, about it, though, is that you could only steal uh, the amount of money that was already in your account. You couldn't steal the entire balance of the smart contract. Well, uh, just looking at it, that's not obvious, and uh, it clearly wasn't obvious to someone else because he went, uh, less than an hour later, someone started trying to deposit funds into this and exploit this bug. So there's people who are actively looking for these bugs, clearly, and also not really thoroughly reading the source code to figure out whether or not it's safe. Uh, if I was actually trying to exploit this, you know, I basically just had to raise the amount of funds that someone needed to deposit to try and exploit the bug, uh, but, uh, uh, and, you know, make it so that they couldn't withdraw any funds. I didn't do that, uh, so the guy was successfully able to uh, recover his few cents, but um, it, it just shows how, uh, that, how prevalent this thing is. So, someone did something very, very similar. Uh, in February, a uh, currency tycoon uh, posted on Reddit uh, about uh, how he lost some money trying to exploit one of these uh, one of these wallets. And the contract was named Private Bank, and it was just a simple wallet contract, and it had a very, very obvious vulnerability. So obviously, looking at this code, uh, the, the uh, contract calls out to an external attacker-controlled contract before it actually updates the balances of the user. So, uh, in theory, this should be uh, exploited, and this guy was actually uh, uh, very cautious and took the source code that someone had uploaded to Etherscan for this contract and ran it on a testnet, and his exploit worked. Uh, however, when he actually tried to do it in real life, uh, his exploit actually failed. It looked like it was successful based on some of the debugging information, but he never actually got the and then about so so now he had one ETH in this in this contract, and about 20 minutes later, someone actually successfully exploited the bug, which was interesting to say the least. So uh, what's the problem here? 
Well, uh, it's internal transactions. So the clever thing that this attacker did was when they uploaded the source code to Etherscan, um, Etherscan will actually compile the contract that you upload and make sure that the bytecode exactly matches what is on the chain. If that works, then they can they will mark it as verified and display that source as the official source uh, of the contract. The problem with this is if you call any external contracts, it doesn't actually validate anything other than that the function, that function signatures that are being called actually match. So uh, this particular thing called this transfer log contract uh, and called the add message function in that contract, uh, and it actually called into something that was different than what was actually uploaded in the source. So uh, you look at the source code and it looks entirely innocent, but uh, in reality, the closed source contract does something entirely different. So it's not logging any messages about a transaction. What it is actually trying to do is uh, it will revert any transaction that is made by someone uh, that is not the attacker. So the attacker can exploit the bug, but uh, <laughs> uh, no one else can. So uh, afterwards, after he saw people submitting stuff in there, he just exploited the bug and stole the money. Uh, this also means that someone testing with the provided source uh, will think that it works, but it actually doesn't. So uh, a much simpler approach that some people have taken is, uh, that, that still takes advantage of Etherscan as well, is they uploaded some source, but uh, all they did was they hid some code in that source by pushing it off to the side by adding a bunch of white space. So uh, this guy uh, just added an owner.transfer uh, of the entire balance of the smart contract prior to the execution of sending it to the person who uh, started the transaction. So that means is the first transfer succeeds, he gets the money, and the second one fails and uh, loses his money. But an even simpler approach is, uh, as noticed by Shitcoin Sherpa, on a tweet about the best scam he had ever seen. Uh, a user started going around in various cryptocurrency chat channels asking for support. So uh, what he would do is he'd post the private key into these channels, and of course people uh, told him not to do that, but would go in, <laughs> but some people would obviously go in and see that his balance had thousands of dollars in uh, tokens that they could potentially steal. So what it lacked was uh, the currency to pay for the gas that was actually necessary to move those tokens. So people would send in Ether and expect to just be able to move it. What they didn't know was that there was a script monitoring that account that would immediately transfer out uh, any currency that was put into, into the, the account. So it would immediately create a transaction and transfer all the funds back out of the account to an attacker controlled address that no one knew. The, what they also didn't know was that the token that he had chosen to put in there actually had a quirk where uh, just because the balance of the account uh, showed a lot of money that was available, uh, the actual available balance, the tokens could be locked. So uh, you were actually able to transfer the funds uh, out of, uh, the, you, you actually weren't even able to transfer the tokens even if you won the race condition uh, where, and beat them to the punch transferring the funds. So probably the most technically interesting to me is uh, Crypto Roulette, where uh, it purports to be a gambling smart contract. So if you guess the right number, you get, you get money. The contract had pretty poor secret generation, but even worse, it was actually storing the secrets on chain. So anyone who looked at this contract would think, oh, I can see the secret number, I'll just guess it and I'll make money. Well, didn't actually work out that way. Uh, this trick, uh, the, the code actually looks very, very innocent and like it shouldn't do anything. But the trick was is that there was actually an uninitialized structure that uh, you were writing to. <laughs> uh, and by default, that writes to storage location zero. Well, this guy actually was overwriting the secret number on the chain whenever it executed the uh, person would lose, and then he would set it to some other sort of random value, so you never even knew that that happened, and you wouldn't unless you stepped through the contract pretty carefully. Um, the last one I'm gonna talk about is the multiplicator contract, and uh, basically this thing was deployed in late 2017, it was one of the first ones uh, that was out there, but the, the trick in this contract was that uh, 
if people didn't know this stop balance was uh, correct, um, uh, if it was updated uh, as soon as uh, before this function started, they wouldn't realize that the message dot value, the amount that I'm setting in, could never actually be greater than this dot balance in the contract. So uh, uh, you'd send in more money than what was in the contract, expecting to get all your money back out, and it wouldn't work. So uh, it's uh, undeniably satisfying <laughs> to watch these scammers lose money, uh, but. You know, these demonstrate some serious issues with the ecosystem that should probably be addressed. Number one, there's lots of work to be done uh, with Solidity still to make it more intuitive how it behaves. And Explorer tools really need to be more careful about how they present data to people because uh, it obviously enables some of the scams. Um, but I'm interested to hear, too, uh, what other people think about that. Um, so that's my talk. Uh, does anyone uh, have any questions? No, so that's actually dictated by the miners. Um, so it, it's sort of a free market system based on demand. Yeah, yeah. So so the miners are the ones who are actually confirming transactions to to this chain. So it fluctuates based on how many people are issuing transactions. But yeah. What did you do with the stolen money after this? So because the way the contract was designed, uh, the, the, the guy was actually able to withdraw his, his few pennies from the, uh, from the contract, but it could have been written slightly differently and he wouldn't have been able to do that. <laughs>